Hello everyone! We're making a very important transition beginning in this video because we're going to be talking about the second major way that we can represent phenomenon in a GIS, and that is using the raster data model. And we're going to get into it in some detail here, but really I'd like to start off talking about rasters by showing a, a few maps that people are very familiar with and see a lot of, and pointing out the vector data that you see but then also this new kind of data, the raster data. So here they are. Everyone has seen weather maps like this. So we've got some uh, precipitation over here and we've got current temperatures over here on the other side. And I bet that if you're looking at this, you can already point out where all of the vector data is. Because of course, geographic information systems are used all the time when you're doing meteorology, when you're doing uh, weather forecasting in general, uh, used all the time because of course when you're doing weather predictions or doing any kind of weather modeling or even climate modeling, of course you're concerned about the location. Where are these events happening? So geographic information systems are used in this all the time. So let's just go over here and take a look for the vector data. Look, we're pointing out where we've got highs and then also we've got lows. Well, where do we have that? What's, what is that represented by? Well, that's represented by a point, right? And then we can also see lines in here. These lines are giving us our barometric pressure. They're actually doing that in a very uh, specific way, and we will talk about that more uh, in a future lecture. Of course, we've got uh, the lines here for the fronts, and you can tell they're symbolized differently depending on what kind of front each uh, one is. We've got different symbols here. Of course, as far as the base map goes, we also have vector GIS data. I mean, you have probably recognize, I'm sure it's not exactly the same files that we've been using, but you can see the vector-based geometry of all of the states here in the background and also the territories of Canada and also a bit of Mexico here. So that is uh, vector GIS data that this is being brought in on top of. Over here on this map, we have lots and lots of different points. We've got all these different weather stations which are reporting current temperatures. And so you can just tell that if we had a point for each one of these weather stations, we probably have an attribute table that has every one of the measurements that the station is recording. And so we just have uh, each station at the moment symbolized with some number in its attribute table according to the current temperature that it is reporting. So just by looking at this, again, sort of like how we've looked previously at Google Maps and tried to look at, oh, well, maybe some kind of understanding about the way that the data model is set up uh, that runs Google Maps, you can just look at this now and begin to tell a little bit about how uh, these uh, weather maps are probably being created and how their data is being stored. But what I would like to point out is that there is some representation on here that is not all vector. We have some raster representations of different phenomena that are on both of these maps. Over here, over here on this map, check out this region right here. Well, and over here. We can see that this map is showing precipitation. We have some over here as well. And we have our legend up here that tells us what kind of precipitation it is. Light rain, moderately heavy rain, uh, rain, ice, snow, and so forth. So we've all seen maps of this kind and we've seen that animate so that we can see that it move, uh, move across the, the precipitation move across the country during the day. But this information is not being held using the vector data format. This information is actually being held using the raster data format. Likewise over here, we're using the vector data model to represent the weather stations and symbolizing them according to their temperature. But then look at all the colors that we've got back here. They're also showing us temperature according to the color scheme here in the background going from the reds all the way up here to the purples. So we're also getting temperature information over here based on this color overlay that we've got. And likewise over here we've got this, this color overlay for all of the precipitation. Well, just uh, like this is raster data over here for precipitation, we're looking at temperature over here in raster data model. We're using the raster data model. And what the raster data model is, in brief, is basically a grid of cells. 
and these grids of cells can be coded uh, by a value. And we'll go over this much more explicitly, but I wanted to give you an example of what we're talking about here and sort of a, a, a real world example that we see all the time. So you can tell that maybe if I covered the United States in a grid of cells over here with our precipitation, and then at every single location in the cell, it's having some kind of precipitation. Is it light rain drizzle, uh, moderate rain, heavy rain? Maybe I can even record the, uh, the amount of rain that was received in that particular cell at that particular location. You know, when I grid up the United States, covered the United States with a grid. Uh, and then I could just classify that grid by saying, okay, well, if you've got less than a quarter of an inch or half an inch, okay, that's light rain or drizzle. If it's if you got a half an inch to an inch, maybe that's moderate rain or something like that. And then I could color every one of those cells based on what category I had assigned it to. That's the raster data model. So this isn't this isn't vector data model with geometry that is showing me the uh, precipitation over here. What I'm being being shown here is basically a grid of cells. And this grid of cells may be very, very tiny. We've got lots and lots of little cells. And each one of them is coded according to the amount of precipitation. And that's the same thing that's going over here with temperatures as well. You know, every position in the United States has a temperature. We don't just have temperatures at the weather stations. You know, there's no weather station right here, but it does have a temperature. And so because temperature is something that is, that is present across the entire United States, well, then it makes sense to represent this with the raster model over here because I can overlay that grid, a, a very tiny grid. You know, well, the grid can be whatever size you want it to be. We'll talk about that as well later. But if I overlaid a grid on top of the United States and then in every single cell recorded its temperature, then I could have the computer go by and say, hey, I'd like to color this grid so that uh, if you're in the 70s, please color it this, uh, this orange color. And then as you get down into negative temperatures or very low temperatures, go over here to purple and please make that a stretch. And it would produce this coloration across the United States. We do have an important distinction here between discrete phenomenon and continuous phenomenon because we have to think about that when we're making representational choices in GIS, but we're going to get into that in detail as well. But for now, uh, I guess what I wanted to do was just sort of introduce you to this other way that you've seen in everyday life about representing geographic phenomenon that is using something other than the vector data model. So it's very important for us to understand both. Both vector and raster representation is very useful, and there's a lot that you can do with both of them. And there are situations where one kind of representation is appropriate and situations where the other kind of representation is appropriate. So this also kind of brings us back to the issues of problems with representation. We've got different, kind of, uh, different kinds of features. How are we going to represent them? How are we going to represent them for what purpose? That's always something we want to keep in the back of our mind. So we're always going to be thinking about as well to what purpose are rasters best put. If you've got something that you're trying to do, well, is it easier, is it better to represent the features you're trying to work with in raster format rather than vector format in order to accomplish certain analytical tasks? All right, I guess that's kind of my opening for the raster data model. We'll get into what they are, how are they constructed, and how they are used in much more detail starting in the next video.